So, dear ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the next session uh, about Rainflow simulation. Let me first introduce our team. My name is Ilya Tsikur. I'm the host of today's webinar. Beside me sits uh, Mr. Jörg Langhardt. He will be responsible today for all the live questions that will come in from your side. So please, I want to encourage you, if during the presentation you have any questions, please um, don't be afraid to just write them and we will try to answer them live. And some of the questions we will also address at the end of this uh, web session. Another information is that we have the presentation as PDF available for download uh, within the webinar tool. You can find it under downloads. So feel free to download the PDF so that you have the documentation straight away. Um, what, is, what is the Rainflow simulation about? So as you know, we can calculate gears. First of all, uh, the, the general case is with uh, nominal load. So we enter some power, some torque, some speed. And in order to somehow model some peaks of the torque, we can use the application factor. And if we want to run more complex calculation, we would actually work with a load spectrum. So we would enter as user uh, a load spectrum. And now we want to take it to the next step. So uh, imagine you would have a sensor system that basically can record or, or sense the torque data live. And now you have this data over time and with KISSOFT new module rain, rainflow simulation, you can basically based on this measured data uh, as time series, you can create a load spectrum. Um, I also want to show you the corresponding module for that. You will find that on our homepage in the products under module list. So if we open the module list, you will see it on, I think it was page 22, right at the end of the module list. And the module is called ZZ9 load spectrum from measured torque curve. In addition, I would like to point out um, the next coming web demos. We have three web demos still planned this year. One is in, uh, actually we have two in October, one that will be performed directly by the Kisoft AG. It's about closed loop design, manufacturing and measuring. It's on the 6th of October. In addition, we have in October another web demo which will run through the Gleason Corporation. You will find it under training, um, live demos, and you will find there is another web demo in October on design of plastic gears, which is on 1st of October. Feel free to subscribe. And we have another web demo planned in December. It's about NVH with Kisoft and Recordine. Uh, so this, this is our plan for this year. Uh, with this, I would like to give the word now to Dr. Michael Stangl, and he will present you the rainflow simulation. I wish you all have fun listening to this web demonstration. The participants of this webinar, welcome to this presentation, Rainflow Simulation today. Of course, you all may have heard already that it does not really has to do something with raining or a rainy day. Um, as you all know, it is a kind of method to get uh, a load spectrum from measured data in general, and we are using it for calculating the load spectrum of gears in general. So what I'm going to show what I'm going to show you today is um, First of all, the objective in general, we want to get a load spectrum from the method measured data. Then we will have a look at the general algorithm we, we are going to use for this. And um, there, part of this algorithm, uh, also counting algorithms are used, methods for counting the measured data, which I will show you some of them that you know that rainflow is just a special case, a special one for uh, our case, which is good, but there are several others and that you have to know that uh, it depends on what you would like to calculate to use these kind of counting algorithm. 
And uh, as a second chapter then after this um, counting algorithms, I will show you how to get therefore the load spectrum from these counted results. But at the end, we are not finished because in the end we want to have stresses. And at, at the end with the stresses also something like YM in an hay diagram, which you can use for calculate. So I also show you the last step, we, how we can get from these load spectrum and the general stresses, some kind of general um, stresses which you can use in the hay diagram and the YM factors, which we can use then for gear root uh, braking uh, calculation or flank calculation. So this is what we're going to First, the, the objective, as you see on the left side, very often you have in reality the a spectrum which you get from sensor data or in the life, life in the field. It's getting more and more, I think, in wind energy. They have live data already all over there because uh, it's very important. But also in, during prototyping, you just gain these kind of data, which uh, are very often used then for getting the real life into our calculation. And in the earlier times, they had to really calculate how often each torque was there. And of course, um, several people thought about, uh, it, it's very tiring to go through really these data and calculate each single values. So they uh, considered about um, a special algorithm, how to count these values and what are the main values to get there. Um, yeah, we will show you today two of them. And with this counting, you get a frequency of a bin and the bin which are belonging to these measured data. So this is, in fact, the main goal. We have measured data. We count it here in Kisoft by two methods. First, the simple count method. Second, also the rainflow method, If especially if you have positive and negative signs like here is shown in the picture. You use the rainflow method because it's better um, um, to be used for this kind of um, hysteresis, which in the background is been done. And then you can get as a target an easy load spectrum. So the general algorithm first, as, we, as I said, we have some input data somewhere. And uh, first of all, we have to decide do we want to get the input data as a general spectrum for the whole machine or want to, do we want to have a look at single T's? And uh, when is this important? For example, if you have a machine which is starting always from the same position, um, like uh, fine mechanics machines or something where you say, okay, it's always a fixed angle which is just turning around 90 degrees and then going back, then it's very important to get the teeth from this load spectrum um, which, which has the highest torque. But uh, for example, at a car, it's not necessary, then an average is has to be looked at. Though you have first have to decide whether you want to have a look at the sim single teeth or you want to have a general information. And then the program is going through the whole array of data and looking, just collecting the in the time signal, just these signals which belong to the T's or not. So we just can go through all and get um, all information together. And we say, okay, it's not interesting to get it to a single tooth. So you see here, for example, there is an information signal like a torque here, 1,500 about, and which is going down uh, after some time, 170 seconds about, and it's getting to negative values. The red one is the measured value, and you see the blue is each single tooth. You see there, uh, of course, in one rotation, the just one tooth, is getting into contact after some time. And you see these peaks here. This one, for example, is the tooth. First there's zero, then it is going into the mesh contact, and then again back to zero. So the signal, the fifth teeth, for example, C is, is that one, 
and then again that one and so on. So you have to collect out of the data first the belonging data to this teeth. To, to go on there, you can see how I said there are different counting methods and uh, one of the main uh, information we in Kisoft want to have is whether you have positive and negative signs of the measured torque or not. Because um, these different counting methods are very good for special cases. The 2D counting method brain flow, which you're talking about later, is very good for getting an hysteresis, the main um, stresses um, going up and down out of a big uh, number of data. And this one is especially good or just usable for changing torques. If you don't have changing torques, torques it's not necessary to do this kind of um, method. You can just use a simple counting method, which you also call a simple count. And then you also can think about getting uh, the speed to this uh, information of the torque. So we can also decide to set the load bins also for the speeds and collect them or not. So in the end, you have um, always here Ka, K gamma, Kv, and Ym. And here um, Ka and K gamma. But for both, you get um, for the tooth flank with the load spectrum, you consider only the positive load pins and the tooth for the tooth root with load spectrum, we all evaluate all negative load pins as positive. So this is the general method to go through rain flow or not, simple count otherwise. So I wanted to, I had already said that there are different counting algorithms. This is quite old already. There is an old Dean uh, norm from 1969 already, where it is written how to count these informations, uh, these talks, and there are several ways to do that. Here is just a small overview from the FVA Richtlinie counting methods from 2020, uh, 2010. First, the one parameter counting methods, this contains peak counting, level crossing counting, range counting, range pair counting, and the two parametric counting methods, which are, for example, range mean counting from two counting, range pair mean counting and range flow counting. Of course, these are just words. Um, I, I first time ever I saw it, I did not have an um, imagination what that could be. So I just got to some examples about some of these counting methods. First, what in general is a counting method? We have some measured variable, some kind of measured value, doesn't matter whether speed or torque or whatever, over the time. And then we get here a number of classes to it after the desired precision. Here I will add eight classes. I think I've seen in old times, they often used 64, um, but you're free as many as you like to do the as many as you like. Uh, symmetric around the zero or whatever you would like to do. And then um, in these classes, you just get together the values you are set, you're saying which are relevant. So for example, in peak counting, as the name says, we just have a look at the peaks of the measured data. You see here in class eight, there are one, two, three, four, five, six uh, peaks inside of this class number eight. So we just count six events and we say the frequency of this event class eight is six times. Um, the same for class seven is just one and so on and so on. So interesting at this, we get this kind of profile, a frequency of classes, a uh, frequency of classes, 610-11222. So if I'm counting in another way, I will get another uh, frequency and that's why there are though so many different kind of counting methods. It depends on what you write, what target you like to get, what objective you have, what kind of counting methods you have to choose. So the second example I wanted to show you is the level crossing counting, the same uh, values here. And I'm counting just if the signal is going from one class in a positive way to another. So the first one would be here and so on. 
And then I can also go through and count. So there are one, two, three, four, five events from seven to eight, so five and so on. And you see, I get here 0555 A totally different result than before because the method of counting the values is done by another way. But um, now to the th methods we are interested in, uh, in we are using in KISSoft for as counting uh, a method called simple count. As I mentioned already, sometimes we wanted to extract just the, the some single twos out of a measured signal. Um, sometimes we don't want, so especially there, this method is very useful. So as you see, I have now in every single time step, um, one certain tooth which is getting into mesh. So out of the signal, I grab out certain values which are used then for counting the frequency. So here in our uh, case, we have one, two, three, four, five times um, the tooth meshing with the other tooth. So we have here five events for class seven, three events, and so on. And um, this is what we implemented as a standard counting method. Um, if you don't have changes in the talk between zero and uh, positive and negative values. So it's very simple and you don't get many, um, you don't lose any effects you have of, of because of the data, but um, you get um, especially the informations out of it, what you want. Now to the so-called rain flow data which is why <laughs> the subject of our meeting today. So the rainflow algorithm is also done as we as the other methods. First, we spread some number of classes above the values over the signal, which is done over the time here. Here are the stress. And then we just here name some special peak events here by some numbers or here A, B, C and so on. And with this, I can show you a bit better or clear the way how the algorithm is working. So the rainflow algorithm is done or um, has been uh, published already in 1968 by two guys uh, which were called Mr. Matsuishi and Mr. Endo. I think in a Japanese paper and 1974 in an English paper. Since this time, several other published variants have been written here. And also some of these papers are just how to count single, uh, single numbers. Um, some are about getting faster, faster the result. Um, we just implemented two of them. The first is the, the method of Amsalak from 1994. And the second was RSTM from 2005 which you also can choose in the program as method for the rainflow algorithm. So, and what in general does this algorithm do? So that the main definition is you have this signal from left to right from the time is on the X axis and you just turn it around. So the values which have been on the Y axis become to the X and the the time axis is becoming the Y axis. So you just turn around the signal and think about it that water is flowing from the upper corner of a pagoda roof so that uh, it flows on both sides until it is going to some other connection um, of the roof where it is, which is already wet or you just, it is just crossing another, another starting point. I, I'll show you later a bit in the next uh, slide, a bit more clear. So each time a half cycle is defined in the end, there is uh, always it paired to into a full cycle. Um, of course, just if the signal would be infinite. So as you see here, I just turned around the signal by 90 degrees. You see the eight classes. You can see the signal from the top to the bottom and the time is going from up to, to down and the imagination is this is a pagoda roof and in this roof the water is dropping from top down so I'm letting pouring the water down and it is dropping down below so I can get the interesting signals the main signals out of the whole 
um, waves which are beside or between. The waves, of course, I also want to record, but the interesting parts are the big ones because they do the damage in the end to the material. And that's why this rainflow algorithm is very, very good for getting a load spectrum for tools or for gears in general. So if you have a look at it more closely, the drop starts on every extremum here at A and it moves along the roof and it's going down and down until there is a bigger extrema on the opposite roof, which is not the case here until the next uh, side here, or there is a next starting point where the, when the path of the drop is crossed, which started earlier, which is for example here the case, which would be go down, down here below and from B to C again to B and would, would cross here again the red uh, drop of the, um, of the step before or the roof is ending. This is more or less the whole algorithm. So you can go through from extremum to extremum and always draw these uh, single events. And you can see it's like the flow of water above a roof. Okay, what to do with these lines, with these events? We just count now the events. We have here again our signal and the dropping of the water. And you see this is a uh, event which is starting here from class 8 and is going down to, gl to class D and um, this is from 8 to 1, from A to D again to A and, uh, or A to D to E exactly and the class is going from 8 1 to 8 and you can draw something here if you have here the stress and the expansion uh, that like, like an hysteresis curve. Of course, this event is also there. We don't want to forget it, but it's a small event which is singular somewhere and not a part of the whole. The interesting part here at this wave is the big one, the red one. So we can just count every single event which is um, there in that roof. And so we go on and say, okay, this event is here from eight starting to uh, class two and going back to eight and so on. So we have here, our rainflow algorithm and now we just have to count how often these events take place. And there are three different kind of um, ways of counting these events. The first one is just a full matrix with, with a cycle from two. So you just have um, the class where it's starting from and it's going to and you just do one um, line if this event is taking place once. The second one is the half matrix, which in fact is just taking the maximum and the minimum. Here it does not really matter whether you start on eight and go to, to one or start on one and go to eight and vice versa. It's in fact just the mirror or do you put this part over the other. This is also the half matrix. And that the third presentation of this or counting of these um, events is if you just count always the arithmetic mean over the oscillation width. So if you have this event, the red event from starting to cl uh, class eight to one to eight, we just see um, we're going from eight to one to eight. So we just do one line. We count one line here. It's take to place here and here once. And here the, the mean um, of that event is eight plus one is nine divided by two is 4.5. So we start at five and the uh, oscillation width is seven. So we have here that. And so we go on and on and we just counting the events. And in the end you have here uh, a matrix with a certain number of counts inside. And we in Kisoft used, we were just interested in what the cycles um, we're going from two, so it was not interesting for us in the later on, we don't need the information where it uh, exactly started. It's just interesting between which classes it was. So we used the half matrix in the middle. And um, then of course we have just a matrix with counting these hysteresis and how often these hysteresis took place. But what should we do with it? Um, of course, you have to go on and get some more information about the load spectrum. So in general, the definition of a load cycle, as you all know, is some you have some mean stress and the stress in general reaches some upper and some lower stress. 
and it's uh, the definition is called that um, you have uh, the ratio between those both borders as lower divided by upper which is called r and um, this one sinus here is just the definition the general defi definition of one load cycle and that you have to find now in these signals so we have to get we have of course general signals which are not starting at zero or above or below so we have to get some more information out of these um, these matrices these rainflow matrices to get uh, the general um, load cycle information so these kind of load cycles you always use in engineering for example in an Avila curve uh, which is called SN curve um, I think you all know that if you are in the first region we have here the number of um, movements uh, to the right side and the, the logarithmic um, in, on the y-axis the, the, the stress in a logarithmic way and if um, some kind of object or whether gear or shaft is in this region it's called the plastic region um, and uh, in the in some other it starts to go down so if you're just starting with the strands and going very very often and doing these loads some on you reaching that um, that part of green curve then then of course the material will fail and the last one is called the infinite life which is um, if you just have some stress which is not going very high above then maybe you can reach more than one million or wherever this definite defined point is so this is the classical as n curve which is just dependent on materials so let's get together these general information about the material and the loads of course you may also have seen that there are several other ways to draw this curve so there is also ISO and AGMA, Heibach modified or original, Corton Dolan so there's always discussion about that part in the end whether it's existing or not uh, infinite life is not really uh, there probably so this has been modified several times but you, you, you know perhaps all the SN curve and there are always some assumptions about the material behavior so what is it useful for so if we have really all cycles which are inside or of engine or on a gear pair we just count how often these loads are there and then we can put them in the SN curve and dependent on how often they occur we get some certain um, way of calculating the damage this is called the minus rule which is being used to accumulate the damage or fatigue life of a mechanical part of a channel fatigue part you can just imagine if you just have for example one stress of this size which is shown here just n times then we would just here have below this this small uh, rectangle here and if we just increase the number of cycles by a certain way until you reach big n1 then of course this machine would break but um, alone with this it does not break so we can say okay let's accumulate that event with this event and so on and then we can reach sometimes pay maybe 100 percent that it also in total would damage the whole machine or the gear so this is called minus rule and um, minor palm green minor linear damage hypothesis and our goal our objective here is to reach all loads um, and stresses which are inside of the machine more or less if possible just in that way so to go on now um, how do we get that from that rainflow matrix we have always a hay diagram for the stresses so hay, hay diagram maybe you you um, remember it's just a way of showing the mean stress on the x-axis and on the y-axis the stress um, pulsating stress so you have the general cases which is always there 
um, from um, if the lower stress is, for example, here zero, then you get the ratio between the upper and lower is minus infinite, or that if you have a, a classic alternating um, bending, yeah, then R is um, minus one, or if you are above the zero point, so you have just uh, tensile pulsating stresses, um, then you have R is zero. And these, uh, in the static way, it's R plus one. These are the main points you always have uh, as a general um, um, event. And to get these all together, this has been done in an hate diagram. And that's very important because the the tensile stress, stress decreases the fatigue strength in general and the um, compressive mean stress is, uh, increases the fatigue strength. So you have always to know which mean stress there is at the moment and you have to calculate um, as an, it is in reference into that height diagram. So as you see again here, this is R minus one. This is R minus infinite. Here also shown again by these small pictures. This is R zero and this is R zero dot five. And this red line is how an height diagram in general is um, defined. You have here the tensile mean stress on the right x, x axis and the compressive mean stress, uh, mean stress on the left yeah, x axis, and that is sigma a. And the red line is the border where it will fail. And our aim, our objective is now to define that an height diagram for a gear pair or a gear or tools in general. And uh, Goodman just reduces this kind of look of the uh, hate diagram by one general um, line. So we put now our knowledge about what we had uh, about um, the collect collective uh, or the rainflow matrix in one hate diagram, which has been defined by Annex A by two certain uh, material um, definitions. The first one is RP02 and the second is RM where the material is always breaking. This is the point where the material, if you stretch it, stretch it um, is, is there is still some kind of uh, length, more length than the original there by um, zero to two percent. So this is something where you don't, you don't reduce it to the original smaller state if, you, if uh, the strength is high, getting higher than this. So these are the, the most important numbers you get from, from the material to draw now an hay diagram just for the gear. Um, we called it here now with the points A, B, C, D and E. And you see here again, um, R0 is here in point A, R minus one is here directly on the y-axis and r minus infinite is here on the side. This is just how it is defined that it should work for gears. So um, we have to just define now these kind of borders in a mathematical way to get a connection between the different general points which are there or there or whatever, wherever here in the field and the limit and then count together all to standardized um, uh, standardized cases, so we can get a standard load spectrum out of it. So what we are doing here is we describe this kind of um, border in a mathematical way, and with this we can get a description for YM. Um, as you can see here, I just extracted just that part out of the height diagram. Um, this is the RM where material breaks. This is the yield strength. This is the um, tools root fatigue strength for pulsating loads, point A. And point B uh, and M is the ratio of, the, of that violet linear, the mean stress, mean stress ratio, which is the uh, um, definition of the line, uh, line of that violet line. 
um, and the ratio we're using for now define ym. So how to get ym from general from the height diagram? Uh, the height diagram I showed you how we defined it. First of all, we have the ratio. Um, you can define by the ratio of sigma min divided by sigma max, or just most uh, slow, the up, most upper torque divided by the uh, lower torque. And uh, the same here, uh, upper minus lower divided by uh, two, and the mean, which is just the standard definition. And um, here we define that um, equation, the linear equation of that via that line by M and the dif uh, differential of the x-axis. So these are four basic equations we just gain by the definition of uh, these kind of um, uh, values. And the gradient we just can define by the ratio of those both uh, stresses. So we have five different equations, which we just combine now with a trick. Um, we have just a load case, a swelling load case with, with R is zero. You see there is just the, the zero line. And we have a general load case, which is B, which is somewhere here, exa for example, on that, on that line here. And we have a certain connection between both now by this equation. And the trick is here, the SF is the same for both. And R for that one for A is zero. So we can have here the combination of both equations and put them together. Um, so we can have a definition of YM, which then is defining the, uh, the, the, the ratio between these, um, uh, which, which you have to use for calculating the, the, um, the part which is breaking. So in, in the software, you can see that also you can define in KISSoft the alternate bending factor here by, by this, or you just uh, see uh, in general, if you have an alternating uh, load that would be defined by 0 0.7. If you have a pulsating load, this is one, or if you have oscillating, you have other. The main trick is now to get this in general from the given spectrum. So we can define that now by that equation. And that I want to show you now. So just as a summary, I showed you a general algorithm that we use, which is used to create a load spectrum from the given measurement. Then there are different counting techniques which we could use to get some special information out of the, the row of the measured numbers. So we showed you one uh, of the one, the one we use, so the simple count and the rain flow. I also showed you some other ones to have a general idea about these kind of uh, methods. And then I got the gathered load is then used for cal calculating the stresses and counting the frequencies of each cycle. And from these stresses, in the end, with these kind of uh, um, equations, these many equations I showed you, and the material data, I can calculate YM. So, so let's have a short example um, in our program. Here you can see um, uh, the Excel, the Excel file of one measured data here, um, the torque and the speed above the time. There is a screenshot of the, our program where, where, which I will show you also later um, how it is used. And then you can give the result here by some reports or some graphics. I can show you now live. So let's load an example. We have here a standard case, and um, here in the in that uh, load spectrum we have this button, and also in the calculation where we can add now a CSV file, which I'll take now from an example file, which is our real measured data. So, and there the the result will be saved in a load spectrum file, which I also define here on the, on the desktop. So, and now we can say, okay, let's have a grid for these talk resolutions. You know, remember these classes, the number of classes. I want to show you this also in the text file. So let's take for the first time um, 10 just, uh, of course it's better to get more, but 
I think 1,000 are not very appropriate. The, the less you get in the end in the load spectrum, the better and the faster you can calculate. So there's always a good compromise necessary, but here I use 10. You can also take a look at the spread of the torque bin width. So um, the default is that you have a linear spread of these, um, these bins above the Y axis. So each class is has the same width there or you can change that so because the most relevant are the one with the maximum so the minimum or maximum um, value so the interest interesting parts at the end if you talk if you have zero or 10 newton meters it's not so relevant for the damage as 500 newton meters so you can say okay i if, if i have um, a range from zero to 500 newton meter let's take um, 400, 410, 450, 490, and 500 or something, also in a progressive way. But um, from 400 to zero, we just use 100 or so. So in, in general, you have um, the possibility to have here um, a different kind of bin size. And then we say, okay, we are not interested now in doing real all uh, angles or uh, have the possibility to, to also get determine the biggest and smallest damage and so on. No, I want to have just the T number of the T's with the, at the degree position with five degree. And I want to show you also some results between. So I just show you the rainflow matrix and the height diagram. So this is the calculation. We get some results here. Um, okay, I have to change the scale for showing the whole thing. Uh, we can have a look at the beginning. Here you see there is also the start. We have different uh, relevant parts here. You see the number of teeth. So let's have here the coordinate system uh, for all. And this is the same view as you get in Excel here. You can choose um, for the measured data, another color for as for the, the other one. And uh, yeah, let's have a look at the report also. So you can see you get here also uh, the load spectrum as a result. Here are the torques from minus 800 to plus 840. And um, how often they are cool. And um, that you also can see here the indication of damage potential. As, as I said already, the most damage is happening here in the last uh, from, from 17 to 20 bin, 20 bin. So this is where we have um, about 840, 600 Newton meters. And below there's more than nothing, of course. So, and the rain flow, you can also see here the triangular matrix. As you see here is going from two, um, how often these events occur. You can have a look at that. And so you can really see how the YM calculation is been done by the occurrence of each value. So this is very easy to calculate. And in the end, you just say, okay, let's accept it and we get that load spectrum in a program and we can directly calculate with it. So you can have a look. This is done directly with the calculated CSV file. And of course, we did also some tests with some simple um, examples. So we just also did some small, uh, very easy examples with um, just a small number of um, talks over the time. And you can also try this on your own. You just create them directly in Excel, for example, and you can check whether the rainflow matrix is fitting and what kind of load spectrum you gain from that, whether it's okay, though it's very easy really to, to get uh, into, the, um, into the results between. And um, you can also, um, of course, have more complicated measured data than, than we just did now. I think we have just 100,000. I think there is no real border above because um, uh, yeah, it would be interesting for, for me to, if you, if you test it with, with more, but um, that's it more or less. I hope that I could show you some um, background about the rainflow method 
and what we are doing in the program and how you can use that. And I hope that you, um, that we see us or meet us in the web meeting again or in real life. And I give now the word to Mr. Zikur. Okay. Thank you, Michael, for this interesting presentation on Rainflow. Now um, I will ask a couple of questions regarding this. First, I would like to start with a general question to Jürg Langhardt. So um, by your opinion, Jürg, in which industry is it beneficial to use, let's say, instead of, instead of predefined load spectras, to use real measured data and to extract the load spectrum from that? What, what is the advantages? Yes, uh, thank you for this question. Um, actually, the, the, initial, the initial start of this project, uh, the initial request was from uh, Offroad Automotive. Yeah. So they had a measured uh, time, time series uh, of torque and they had the problem that they needed to uh, count these, these alternating loads. Um, because there is not, there's not a, was not a general rule uh, or method uh, existing so far. So they approached us and asked us for for help, for assistance, and this was the start. So the automotive definitely has an, a big benefit of that method, but also we we have uh, uh, feedback from wind industries. V wind industries they uh, typically uh, do very many measurements, yeah, uh, because they are. Um, they want to um, make measurements due to predict uh, prediction of life. So the life prediction is a very very big topic in wind industries. So I think these are the most they are the most um, typical areas where this rainflow counting method can be applied. Also, let's say an idea of us is to have maybe then the the part of the predicted maintenance yeah so that uh, maybe we will be able in future to say okay due to the current load of these uh, drivetrain due to the current load situation you will need to make a maintenance in maybe uh, half a year this could also be an uh, application field where we think uh, the rain field uh, the, the rain flow method can be applied Okay, thank you. A second, second question was uh, regarding um, the application of the method itself. Now, we have seen that the corresponding module for the rainflow is for gear calculations in general. Now, so the question is, is it also applicable, this load spectrum that you get, is it applicable for systems, like for, for entire gearbox? Um, currently not. Currently, we developed this method purely for the gear calculation. As you have seen, we uh, want to calculate the pure uh, gear load. So we so we uh, check for each gear tools load separately. But actually, this was the more difficult part. The easier part is then to enhance this this calculation also on shaft and bearings. No. So, and of course, now we are working on this. We want to extend this method also for a full drivetrain. And we will uh, let you know whenever this is ready, we will have it, um, we think so for next release then. Okay, thank you. And the, fin and the final question is regarding the method itself. So uh, it's clear if you have bending or if you calculate root strength, you have to calculate the alternating bending factor and you have to count the with the corresponding method. Now, what happens with pitting? Because pitting normally uh, is only used on one side of the flank. Or, uh, so, so how is this considered uh, in the calculation method itself? Yes, that's true. Actually, this this rainflow counting method we only need because of the, the alternating load, yeah, which happens on the two's root. So actually, for the pitting, for the contact stress calculation, the situation uh, luckily is much easier. The contact is always in in uh, pressure load, and 
this does not need any rainflow counting. So Christoph has since many years already the load spectra generation for the flank context stress calculation. This is already or this was already implemented in Keysoft uh, before. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Um, I hope you enjoyed this web demonstration. The video will be available soon in a few days on our homepage. If you will just check out our homepage for the YouTube video. And with these words, again, thank you to Michal Stangel for uh, informing us, us about this method, for having this uh, great presentation. And we all want to wish you a nice day. Thank you. Goodbye.